All right, classification and nomenclature, classification of ma matter, and maybe nomenclature today. We'll get to nomenclature on uh, Wednesday. <clears throat> so this is kind of changing gears from what we were talking about before, because last week we talked about stoichiometry a little bit, balancing chemical reactions, uh, and we are gonna jump into that more today after we go over this classification of matter stuff. But these are sort of really broad cl classifications um, to try and group things into categories. I mean, that's what it is. That's what classifications are. So matter is probably one of the broadest definitions, if not the broadest. Anything that occupies space and has mass. So you occupy space and you have mass, so you matter. So your textbook, your chair, desk, everything composed of matter. Uh, so a specific instance of matter, so if we're not just talking about all matter, if we wanna talk about this thing over here, or this type of thing, it would be a substance. So this substance is like a smaller portion of matter. We can classify, classify matter according to its state, which is its physical form, um, or its composition, and actually, and its composition. So the basic components that make it up. So solid, liquid, gas, and then what are all of the things inside of that solid, liquid, or gas? So we're gonna start with the states of matter, and we're sort of, we're gonna very quickly tunnel in on more and more specific states of matter, because super general states of matter are only slightly useful. The more specific you get, the more useful the classification gets. So we classify things as solids, liquids, or gases. Hopefully those are familiar to you. And the state of matter changes from solid to liquid gas with increasing temperature for most things. Uh, I think a couple weeks ago, maybe it was last week, talking about the chromium, it's like lead chromate or something, and it didn't have a uh, boiling point, but it had a decomposition point. So some things, instead of getting to the gas phase, will instead fall apart. So solid matter, in solid matter, uh, atoms or molecules pack close together in fixed locations. And really, the biggest things that separate solids, liquids, and gases, I guess there's two things. It's how close the atoms are packed together and how freely the atoms can move around each other. So in a solid, everything's packed super close together and the atoms can't move around each other. They are stuck next to the atoms that are next to them. My favorite analogy for this is like a concert. So if you've ever been to a concert and you've ever been down in front or close to the stage, or at least seen it, during the concert in front of the stage, everybody is packed in shoulder to shoulder and you can't really move around those people. You're kind of stuck where you are, right? But everybody in their spot is still moving around. Uh, that's what temperature is. It's those small movements in their place. <clears throat> So solids are like the crowd uh, during a concert. So because these atoms or molecules uh, do not move around or past each other, and because they're so packed together, they have a fixed volume, oops, fixed volume and rigid shape. So they don't expand, they don't contract, they don't change their shape uh, unless you force them to. So some examples, ice, aluminum, diamonds. <clears throat> I guess students during a lecture is another example. You're sitting in your seats, not moving around uh, very much, not moving around each other. There can be also different types of solids. So crystalline solids where the, crystalline solids where the molecules, atoms or molecules are arranged in patterns with long range repeating order. So if you look at any part of a crystalline structure, it would look identical to every other part of the crystalline structure. <clears throat> Diamond is an example of that. Also, students seated in rows. So if you're seated in rows, well-organized repeating pattern. Other solids are amorphous. So the atoms or molecules have no long-range order. And so any part of it is going to be different from other parts. There's no pattern to the way that the atoms or molecules are arranged. They're just all stuck together. 
So it might be something like kindergartens seating, seated on the floor for a story time. Right? They don't really sit in rows, they'll sit wherever they feel like sitting. Also, I think to go back to the concert analogy, a, depending on what kind of concert you're at, if there's people standing there in a huge group in front of the stage, that would be like an amorphous solid, as opposed to perhaps like a, like a symphony or something else where people are sitting in rows would be like your crystalline solid. The only thing that we really change going from a solid to a liquid is the amount of freedom that the atoms and molecules have to move around each other. They're still packed, in a sense, shoulder to shoulder, but now instead of just being stuck there, they're able to move around and move freely uh, while staying shoulder to shoulder. The liquids have a fixed volume because of this. They're again still right up next to each other, but because they can move around, they don't have a fixed shape. And that lets liquids flow to take the shape of their container. So things like water, alcohol, gasoline, students during lab period is one example. Uh, during a concert, it's kind of like the end of the concert when everybody's trying to leave. As soon as the concert's over, people start moving and trying to go for the exits, and they start to take the shape of those exits as they're trying to push past each other and get through those doors. All right, so moving on to gaseous matter. So for gaseous matter, we've now taken and moved from the liquid, where all the atoms and molecules are close together, they're still all touching, but they can move freely around each other. And the thing that changes when you go from a liquid to a gas is now you've increased the space between all of the atoms and molecules. So now they're essentially so far apart uh, that they're not touching each other and they really don't even see each other. In a sense, they are not even, they don't interact with each other at all. So there's a lot of room for them to move around. And because there's all of this extra space between them, Unlike liquids, gases are compressible. So all of that extra space can be compressed. So you can reduce the space between the atoms and molecules in the gas and force them to get closer together. And if you force them close enough and add enough pressure, they'll go back to a liquid right? and they'll run out of space. But then once they're a liquid, you can't compress them anymore because there's no more space between the atoms and molecules. So the analogy here, uh, like class, students when class is over, you got the doors and you disperse. Same thing at a concert. Once everybody has gotten out of the concert hall or whatever into the parking lot, they disperse and spread out. You could take all those people and you could round them back up close together. Uh, it would take a lot of force and a lot of action and a lot of people, I don't know, moving barriers or something, but they're really spread out, right? Not even interacting with each other anymore. Okay, solids, liquids, and gases. So matter can also be classified according to its composition. And again, we're going from really, really broad definitions down to more and more focused definitions. So started out with everything is matter, and then we said, well, we could have uh, solids, liquids, and gases, and that's kind of one way to classify all of matter. But we can also take those solids, liquids, and gases, and we can also classify them as either pure substances or mixtures. And so this is classifying according to composition. Uh, and we're gonna have elements, we'll have elements and compounds, which are classified as um, pure substances. And we can also have mixtures, and we'll talk about heterogeneous and homogeneous mix mixtures as well. So the first division in the classification of matter would be between pure substances and mixtures. A pure substance is made up of only one component and its composition is invariant, which really means that it's the same all the way through. Right? It doesn't change. Every single part of it is only made up of that one type of thing. In a mixture, by contrast, we've got a substance composed of two or more components in proportions that can vary from one sample to another. So it's not necessarily the case that it's always going to be the same composition throughout. And those sort of ratios, the proportions of the things that make up the mixture can also change. In pure substances, they can't. So for pure substances, I categorize them into two types, elements and compounds. 
So this depends on whether or not they can be broken down or decomposed into simpler substances. So elements are, we've already talked about periodic table. So these are, this is the periodic table of the elements. We can't take any of these and break them down into simpler things without nuclear chemistry. Because yes, you could do nuclear chemistry and you could make new things, you could break things apart, but without going that far, as far as we're gonna go in this class, um, these are the elements that they are and that doesn't change. For the compounds, there'll be combinations of two or more different elements. So elements, right, can't be broken down. Basic building blocks of matter. There'll be single types of atoms. The compounds uh, are substances composed of two or more elements. And then this is the key here, fixed definite proportions. Right, we've already talked about the law of definite proportions. And so when we're talking about compounds as sort of a classification of matter, we're talking about those things that follow the law of definite proportions. They're always gonna have the same amount of hydrogen or oxygen. So most elements are chemically reactive and they're gonna be combined with other elements. Most things you do not find pure in nature. So for classifications of mixtures, switching over to the other side of this, we have heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Uh, these classifications get murky real fast. They only work on like a broad sort of superficial level. They are, they are useful, um, but only at that sort of broader level. And so a these classifications depend on the, or on how uniformly the substances within them mix. So we've got mixtures of two or more things. How evenly spread out are those things inside that mixture? So like, oh, I don't have my coffee. Coffee's the example that I always use. That's a, depending on how well you filter it, is a homogeneous mixture. And a heterogeneous mixture would be something like sand and water. So the heterogeneous mixture, there's gonna be different composition of sand or water inside of that container or sample. And then the other hallmark about mixtures is that right, we could change the ratios. So if you got sand and water, you could add more sand or you could take some water out and you could do that until it's all sand or it's all water. Anything in between is a mixture. And so that proportion can change. Even for something like coffee, right, there's stronger coffee, there's weaker coffee, there's like coffee from Denny's, which you can drink 14 cups of and have no effect because it's basically water with brown food coloring. That tastes bad. <laughs> um, so heterogeneous mixtures, Again, the composition varies from one region of the mixture to the other. And they're made of multiple substances whose presence can be seen. So this is where I, the sand and water mixture. Uh, you can see the sand, you can see the water. You can even shake it up and then watch them separate. So proportions of a heterogeneous mixture have different composition and properties. Uh, and then I'll put up, I do have a Mentimeter quiz thing and we'll put up some examples. And then for a homogeneous mixture uh, is one made up of, actually let's, yeah, because this was heterogeneous mixtures. All right, I'm gonna put this thing up. This will be good, I wanna go over more examples. How do I make this full screen? Did that stay up there? It did stay up there, nice. All right, so the code. Guess I'll put this up. Oh. Did you, can you see that in the back? The code at the top? Can 
should write it larger. Four three nine one. One four five three. One four five three. And it's Oh wait, is this, yeah, it should be in presenter mode. So this is like an open thing. So what are some examples of heterogeneous mixtures? As you type them in and hit enter, they'll pop up on the screen, if everything's set up correctly. So heterogeneous mixture, again, sanded water, or there's a lot of food examples. Green tea, vodka, gasoline. <laughs> this sounds like song lyrics. <laughs> oh yeah, it's gonna make like a word cloud too. Forget about that. Oil and vinegar. So yeah, things like green tea would be a homogeneous mixture, probably. I read it wrong. It's good. Leche, like a. Oh wait, actually, yeah. What's the um? It's like the rice. Horchata. Horchata. Yeah, horchata, right? Has like different consistency without throughout. Cereal is a great example. Different consistency throughout. Salt and pepper. Um. Oh, veggie broth, yeah. You got all the vegetables in there. They're kind of different throughout. Now, something like, something like salt and pepper. Uh, so what if the salt and pepper, though, are like really, really mixed together? That'd be heterogeneous or homogeneous? Does it have the same consistency throughout, or is it different? Yeah. Maybe homogeneous? I could kind of see the argument for both. I think cereals may be the same way. Like, oh, ocean water is a good one. Okay, so yeah, ocean water kind of depends. So what if we thought about just like the ocean as a whole? Is the ocean as a whole heterogeneous or homogeneous? Everything in the ocean. Heterogeneous, right? There's gonna be whales in some places, there's gonna be a coral in some other places. You can see it settle. You can see stuff settle out, but what if you're like out in the middle of the ocean, it's like deep, it's fairly clear, and you take a scoop full of that ocean water, and you look at that, and you kind of see particles in it, but they're kind of like spread throughout the whole thing. Is that homogeneous or heterogeneous? If you look at one part of the ocean water and then look at a different part, is the composition gonna be the same or different? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like okay. If I yeah. So if I go to the beach and I get a, a scoop full of sand from the beach, right, it's not all sand in there. Sometimes you'll get like a piece of seaweed. Sometimes you'll get some other. So I guess I, the reason I say this is to sort of highlight how, at some point, this kind of breaks down. Because I could see an argument for the glass of ocean water that the composition is probably not the same throughout. And then if you're looking at it, you can see the different particles inside. So you could argue that that's heterogeneous, that there's differences in there. But I could also see the argument that it's the same amount of, roughly the same amount if you look at any part of it, you couldn't tell the difference. So would that be heterog or homogeneous? They're kind of vague, but usually, yeah, things that are like, uh, oh, salsa, actually, salsa is great. Salsa is a great example of something that's heterogeneous, but again, could kind of be argued that it's homogeneous, because if you look at all the salsa versus looking at a small part of the salsa. So, yeah. Um, Anyways, so any, anytime I give you a question that's like this, if I give you a question that's like this, to ask if something's heterogeneous or homogeneous, it'll probably be a multiple choice. 
but I'll also give you a couple lines to sort of explain your reasoning. Because I want to see that if you're talking about ocean water and you say that it's homogeneous, that you know, you're making an argument that it's the same consistency throughout. Or if it's, um, you know, there's actually different things, there's things floating in it, and so because of that, it makes it heterogeneous. I'm not a huge fan of these definitions. Um, but I think it does, it is good to know um, the rough idea of each. Oh, actually, I do want to talk about two. So like, vodka by its, vodka by itself would be, I guess, did I make, I don't think I made another slide for this. Because uh, the next one is this. I'm not going to do that one yet. Shoots. So in terms of things that are uh, homogeneous, let's go back to the slides real quick. All right, so heterogeneous. Homogeneous mixtures are ones made of multiple substances, but it appears to be one substance. Actually, this is a better definition. So all portions of a sample have the same composition and properties, so something like sweetened tea. Uh, homogeneous mixtures have uniform compositions because the atoms or molecules that compose them mix uniformly. So if you go back to this, so something like gasoline, if you were to, have you ever seen gasoline like poured into a water bottle? Right? It's clear it looks the same all the way throughout. You can't distinguish anything inside of it. So gasoline would actually be uh, homogeneous. Um, something like vodka also, even though it's a mixture of ethanol and water and like trace other things, because the same, it is the same consistency throughout, you couldn't make any argument that there's like different portions of it in different parts. That would also be homogeneous. Um, so since I didn't make another slide for that, there would be some other examples of things that are homogeneous. Homogeneous? Hot chocolate? I think one weird one is uh, like if you go to Home Depot or something and you buy play sand, that would be, oops, I wrote homogeneous, that would be homogeneous. So like clean sand, sweetened tea is in there, coffee, but not iced coffee because if there's ice in the coffee, then that would be a heterogeneous mixture. And then you've got two distinct layers where one is ice and coffee and the other one's just mostly coffee. Or if you get like a, uh, like a Starbucks drink and they do the caramel drizzle around the edges, that would be uh, heterogeneous. But then if you mix it really, really well and you get all of that caramel off the sides, it could be, and the ice all melts, I guess, that would be homogeneous. Yeah. Uh, paint? Paint. Yeah, well mixed paint. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Once it separates out, then it would be heterogeneous. So there's, there's a lot of room for interpretation and I think the understanding that if something is the same throughout, you can make an argument that it's homogeneous. If it's something like, like um, pure water, Actually, pure water would be salt water. I guess we'll say salt water. So you can't tell that anything's dissolved in the water. You can't tell that it's salt water until you taste it or run some other kind of test. I don't think that there's an argument for making, saying that that would be heterogeneous. So saline is homogeneous? So that would be homogeneous. So like, not ocean water, but salt water. So if I went and I took some DI water here, which is just water, and I got some pure sodium chloride from the back, and I mixed those together, that would be homogeneous.
but couldn't be argued as heterogeneous. Yeah. So if you have ice and water, so you're thinking because it's all H2O, it's all water, it's all water but one's ice. part of it's solid and part of it's not. Would that be enough to classify as heterogeneous? It would be heterogeneous. I would say it's heterogeneous because it's not the same. Heterogeneous? Heterogeneous means different. No, blood though. Oh, blood? Yeah. So I would say before it settles, it would be homogeneous. And then if you s let it settle or if you centrifuge it, then it would be heterogeneous. So like one of the key things about mixtures is that you can separate them. Oh, this is the next Mentimeter thing. So go to this, go to the next slide. So which of these images is a pure substance? I can make that full screen again. And I know they're not super big up here, so hopefully you can see them well enough on your phone. And so pure substance being made up of all the same type of thing. Votes. 14. So that's most everybody. So in 13, or sorry, in 13, in A, A, in A, the key is that each of those, even though we've got two different types of sort of shapes, the red shapes and the blue shapes. The red squares and the blue circles are each connected to each other. And so those are all, you can think of them like molecules. So it's all the same type of molecule. So it wouldn't be an element, but it would be a pure substance um, and a compound. In B, we have things all mixed together. So that would be a mixture. And then in two, even though we have two layers, or sorry, in two, in C, uh, even though there's two layers, uh, it's still in the same space. So that would be kind of like oil and uh, water, right? where the oil and water separate, but in the same container, they would still be a mixture. All right. <clears throat> so mixtures are separable because the different components have different properties, uh, either physical or chemical properties. So various techniques exploit those differences to, you, to achieve separation. Uh, one method, so if you had a mixture of sand and water, you could separate those by decanting. And decanting uh, means to carefully pour off the water into another container. So you let it settle first, and then you pour it really slowly and really carefully so that none of the sand comes out, but all the water comes off the top. Really, there's only so far you can go with decanting. They have those, I don't know if you've ever seen these, for like separating out like fat from like broth, or like cooked a chicken or something, you take all of that chicken juice and stuff, but it has a lot of fat in it. If you want to separate off the fat, there's these, um, they're like measuring cups, and the spout comes out of the bottom. And so the fat will settle and collect on top. And when you go to pour this out of the nozzle, only the liquid, the liquid will all come out of the bottom first. And so you can pour away the broth without any of the fat and then keep the fat behind. It's almost like a reverse decant, kind of. <clears throat> uh, one cool way of doing this is by taking advantage of boiling points of different substances. So if we have two liquids that are in a mixture, we can separate them if they have different boiling points. And this is called distillation. So you heat your mixture on one side, 
and then the more volatile liquid will evaporate first and it will pass through this condenser which has cold water running through it and it condenses back into a liquid and you collect that on the other side. Uh, so that's one way to separate things. Another way is uh, with filtration, which may seem really simple, but if you have a mixture of a liquid and a solid, you pour that through a filter paper, it'll catch all of the solid, let the liquid pass through. This is also my preferred way of making coffee. Pour over, right? So you make a slurry, essentially, of coffee grounds and water, and then you hope that the coffee filter catches all the coffee grounds. That's why I don't like French press. You get that silty coffee. Not a fan. <clears throat> uh, sometimes you can do filtration, especially in organic chemistry. There will be things that you do a chemical reaction, and if you just cool it enough, one of the things in the mixture will uh, solidify or crystallize, and then you can take that cold mixture and filter it while it's still cold and keep those crystals uh, and get rid of any. Pure substances can be broken down into elements or compounds. So there are two types of elements. They can be either atomic or molecular. So an example of an atomic element would be like neon. An example of a molecular element is something like oxygen. And there's a whole set of um, elements that exist as molecular elements. The compounds can exist as two different forms also. One is molecular, the other is ionic. And that has to do with the way that they form bonds. So atomic elements exist in nature with single atoms as their basic units. So that's most elements. There's a subset, like I said, of molecular elements that exist as molecules, which is two or more atoms of the same element bonded together. The ones you need to remember are these ones, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. There are also a couple other ones, uh, phosphorus and sulfur, P4 and S8, so four sul phosphorus uh, atoms bound together and eight sulfur atoms. Uh, let's see, is this in here? Okay. The molecular elements you can remember with the mnemonic, well, the one that I use is Brinkelhoff, so bromine, iodine, nitrogen, uh, chlorine, hydrogen, oxygen, yeah, fluorine. So, kind of spells with word, Brinkelhoff. Does anybody have another one that they use? Different one? I've also heard like an acronym, well, I guess not an acronym, what is it, a anagram? No, not an anagram. Horses need oats for clear brown eyes, but then the I is the letter I and not E-Y-E-S. <coughs> So anytime that you see these elements and it says like gaseous oxygen or gaseous fluorine, it comes up actually a lot in today's uh, worksheet, then you need to write these elements down, this set of elements, the diatomic elements. You need to write them down as that element, but like, but two of them as their diatomic form. Anytime they exist as gases, So they're also on the periodic table here. We'll actually talk later on about why they form and why they are diatomic. Uh, molecular compounds are, way more things are molecular compounds, right? It's very, really a small set that are, are molecular elements, but molecular compounds are composed of two or more covalently bonded uh, nonmetals. So when we get to nomenclature, these are molecular compounds. <clears throat> and a covalent bond is just an even sharing of electrons. And we'll get to talk about that more also later. So something like water, which is composed of H2O molecules. Dry ice is composed of CO2 molecules. And propane, which is C3H8 molecules. Those are molecular compounds. 
And the key here is that it's two nonmetals. Uh, ionic compounds are composed of cations, so usually a metal, so the ones that form positive charges, and anions, which is usually one or more nonmetals, and they're bound together by ionic bonds. And those ionic bonds occur because it's two ions, so positive charge and a negative charge. The basic unit of the ionic compound is the formula unit. And the formula unit is the smallest electrically neutral collection of ions. So when we talk about something like sodium chloride, it's not that sodium chloride exists as individual NaCl molecules. It looks like this, and it's actually a matrix or an array of alternating sodium and chloride ions all snapped together. So we just represent this whole thing because one of these crystals of uh, sodium chloride might be Na one mole, Cl one mole. So that they're all stuck together, but it doesn't make sense to describe an entire large salt crystal like this. So we describe it as the simplest ratio between the two, NaCl. That's why a formula unit is different than a molecular formula. Uh, by the same token, oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry, what was the other type of compound? The compound The molecular compounds? That's yeah. just the same uh, molecule Yeah, so for a molecular compound, like water is composed only of H2O molecules, and so it's a bunch of these molecules all clumped together and they stick together based on intermolecular forces. Yeah. So similar to ionic compounds where there are these really large clusters, uh, something like most crystalline solids, so like diamond. So if you have a diamond and it's a perfect diamond, there's no flaws in it, that's one molecule because all of those carbons are attached to the carbon next to them. And they're all attached through carbons in that crystal structure. So diamond also we would say, oh, diamond's made of carbon. But specifically, it's one molecule made up of all those carbon atoms. Uh, okay. I think we can go back now to, I will rearrange these before I upload them. Ah, see, there's, I went too far again. So I think we've kind of addressed this already, but compounds are composed of atoms held together by chemical bonds. And the chemical bonds are classified into two types. Those are ionic and covalent bonds. So we talked about ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are held together by ionic bonds. <clears throat> and they occur because of a transfer of electrons from one atom to another. So when a metal interacts with a nonmetal, it can transfer one or more electrons to a nonmetal. And that metal ion, the metal atom becomes a cation and the nonmetal uh, atom becomes an anion. Because one loses an electron, the other one gains one or more electrons. So it's Ionic bonds are actually electrostatic forces. So that that's a three-dimensional array. Uh, so it might look something like this. If you wanted to make sodium chloride, you'd be taking sodium metal, chlorine gas, both of those being electrically neutral. So no charge, but in the process of reacting with each other, the sodium gives up an electron to the chlorine, and now we get the negatively charged Cl minus and, and the positively charged Na plus to form this lattice of sodium chloride crystals, all stuck together. They're stuck together because they have opposite charges. 
And then covalent bonds are a sharing of electrons. It's not always equal sharing. Again, comes in a later chapter. But when a nonmetal bond, nonmetal bonds with another nonmetal, there's no electron transfer like there is for sodium and chlorine. They basically say, hey, I'll share some electrons with you if you share some of your electrons with me, and then we'll talk about octets, but then they get an octet of electrons um, each. So because of the way that they're sharing electrons, and because you need to have two atoms that are sharing electrons, two or more atoms that are sharing electrons just with each other, they form, well, molecular compounds. So one cluster, well here's, this is like, um, this is like water. Uh, I won't say it's like water because it's not quite. This is kind of like water. But there's these two atoms sharing with uh, this one in the middle. And so it's the most, oh, actually, sorry. I'm misinterpreting this. These are two atoms, and they're sharing this electron. And that electron is best shared when it's right in the middle of both of them. If it gets pulled from one side to the other, um, that creates higher energies than having it shared between the two. Trying to come up with an analogy. So one of these is like, this is like, this is like getting married and sharing money with your partner. It works out the best when you share that money evenly. Uh, the ionic compounds are like, I don't know, paying rent. <laughs> you give up all this money and now you're stuck there. <laughs> No, that's not a good analogy. Uh, it's a one-off transaction. You're just paying for something. All right, I'm gonna have to workshop that. And essentially, like this is this is paying money into a pool, and everybody sticks together because they've all kind of shared their money in this pool. But this is uh, money being shared just between two or just between a few people. And because it's just shared between a small group, that group sticks together because they've all pooled their money together. And so that's why in, I guess the analogy I'm trying to draw is that in covalent bonds, there's this very localized sharing and they need to stay next to each other so that they can continue to share. Um, and that's why we get molecular compounds that are made up of individual molecules like water versus something like sodium chloride, which would be the lattice. Uh, do another one down here. All right, keeps on going throughout the entire structure. So then our chemical formulas, our compounds are represented by chemical formulas. Um, and we've really looked at these kind of already, but the chemical formulas indicate the elements present in the compound and the relative number of atoms or ions of each. <clears throat> so for things that are molecular compounds, like water, that's showing, telling you that in every single molecule, there's two hydrogens and one oxygen. For an ionic compound, it's telling you that the ratio of sodium to chlorine throughout that compound is one to one. For every sodium, there's one chlorine. Other compounds won't be one to one. They could be something like magnesium chloride, which would be MgCl2. So for every magnesium, there's two chlorines. And that's true throughout the compo composition of that compound. <clears throat> Carbon tetrachloride is also a molecular compound. Again, co molecular compounds are formed from two nonmetals. So carbon tetrachloride means you have one carbon and four chlorines. And because it's a molecular compound, it, that's an individual molecule. So this probably should have gone before we talked about or in between when we talked about how to calculate empirical formulas. 
but the empirical formula is the, actually, these are, these are sorted based on how much information they give you. So the empirical formula is going to be just the simplest ratio, whether it's a ionic compound or a molecular compound, simplest ratio between the atoms. The, and so it gives you the least information. The molecular formula uh, for a molecular compound tells you exactly how many uh, of each element are in that compound. And so it gives you more information than the empirical formula. And then for the structural formula, that will actually show you kind of like, I'll do this for, so for hydrogen peroxide, the empirical formula would be uh, HO. The molecular formula would be H2O2. And a structural formula would be HOOH. So the structural formula tells you exactly how those atoms or, or atoms are bound together. So for hydrogen peroxide, we have one hydrogen bound to one oxygen, which is bound to another oxygen, which is bound to another hydrogen, in that order. So the structural formula gives you the most information. So just some more examples. So C4H8, so for C4H8, the greatest common factor would be four. So you could get the empirical formula as dividing each of those by four. And then for B2H6, the greatest common factor would be two, so its empirical formula would be BH3, which is the simplest ratio. And then the structural formulas use lines to represent covalent bonds and shows how atoms in a molecule are bound together uh, specifically. And single lines for single bonds, double lines for double bonds, and triple lines for triple bonds. But we will talk about that a lot more uh, when it comes to nomenclature. So structural formula gives you the most information, empirical formula gives the least information, Molecular formula somewhere in between um, and is more compact.